Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to a- another episode of the All the Places We'll Go um, with your hosts, myself, Mark, and uh, Richie and Mark. Um, so, just to kick off with, um, I was reflecting on the show just last night, and I think what we do on the show is an absolute privilege. Um, I think it's a privilege that we get to meet so many amazing people. Um, it's a privilege that we get to have an audience who tunes in week on week every Friday at 8 a.m., um, the early birds. Um, and it's a privilege to think that we can add a little spark to your Friday mornings that perhaps as you head into the weekend, you can reflect on and, and maybe even beyond that. And today with us on the show, I think we have a, a genuine spark. Um, a man through his own admission likes to be provocative because he wants to get you to think about things in a different way. He's a huge personality. He's got a huge following of of over 700,000 people. He's an author. He's a founder. And he he also loves to help people change things. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Tom Goodwin on the show this morning to talk about his personal experiences and share some anecdotes about his career. Um, Tom has expressly said that he loves taking hard questions. And so to that end, I would love to see you all ask Tom some really hard hitting questions. And I'm sure um, in a bit of a, a no holds barred fashion, he will be as transparent as ever. Um, And now the last thing before I hand over to Mark to ask the first question to Tom is that Tom's been really generous and he's given you all perhaps a once in a lifetime opportunity to get to know him a little bit better. And he's kindly donated a mentoring session to one of you lucky people in the audience this morning. So in true, all the places will go fashion. All you need to do is take a screenshot of your screen with your favorite Tom Goodwin quote, copy in myself and Mark. And as you know, Jordan will announce the winner later on early next week. So please do that now for a once in a lifetime chance to get to know Tom just that little bit better. It's genuinely been a pleasure for us to have got to know him a bit better, and I'm sure you'll find the same. So Mark, over to you. First question. Thank you, Richie. And good morning, Tom. Great to have you on the show. It's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. So uh, pretty much everyone will be aware that your circumstances have changed a little bit recently. Uh, so let's jump in there and say, how does it feel to be a free man? It's <laughs> a very good question. Um, it's odd, actually. When you work for an agency, you're always aware of how, um, how sort of well-guarded you are from, from reality. And I think everyone working in an agency always has this dream that one day they'll, they'll get to sort of try things for themselves. And most people don't really have the courage to do that. Um, so I've, I've always wanted to, to do this. I've always wanted to try and set up my own thing. Um, so my main feeling is just to, to feel really excited, actually. Like, um, it's, it's amazing to have the vulnerability of knowing that everything is down to you. Um, and it's incredible to know that, um, you know, you have this sort of platform and you have all these things working in your favor. Um, and now you don't get to blame anyone else. You know, you don't get to uh, blame bureaucracy. You don't get to blame people that don't make decisions. You don't get to blame the fact that you're using the wrong software. Um, So more than anything else, I feel really, really excited. Um, I also was very lucky in publicists in that, you know, there are many people who feel very restrained by their jobs um, and they're unable to speak and they're unable to decide how best to do their jobs. And, um, you know, I've been very lucky to, to work with publicists for a really long time um, and, to, you know, to, to leave them in what appears to be worse circumstances than they actually are um, is quite nice. Like for a long time, we've been talking about me, me leaving. Um, so it's, um, you know, I feel like someone's given me the keys to a brand new vehicle and I've just got to figure out how to drive it. Tom, I've got to ask, so you mentioned that you were given, I guess, a, a long rope. Um, when it comes to sort of the the publicist job, I mean, was that by <laughs> hey, but was that by sort of design or like how did you orchestrate that to happen? Because not everyone gets that, and it'd be great to understand kind of what levers you were pulling to make that happen. Yeah, it's um it's really important that the people understand how lucky I was. Like, there, there's no sort of particular genius that went into this incredible plan to 
to be able to be more vocal than other people. Um, all that happened is I, I gradually became better known. And as time went on, um, I was able to ensure that when people took me on, they were aware of what they were getting. Um, so perhaps, um, I think it was about six or seven years ago when I joined Havas, I wasn't that well known at that time. So I think when things started to um, develop in such a way where I'd be asked to speak at events, it was more problematic to them because they didn't know that's what they were getting. Whereas joining publicists, they, they always knew and it was within my contract that I would be able to do a certain number of things. Um, so more, more helpfully when it comes to other people, um, I, I, there's definitely an opportunity. I think, um, you know, advertising is about people who understand people and it's about um, the changing world and it's about imagination and it's about opinions and it's about digesting data. And I think um, I would like to think that if people are well intentioned with that and if people come across as someone that's trying to help in a process, that most agencies should start to become more open to that and they should start to see the sort of benefit in that. I was lucky within publicists that they definitely saw that with me, um, but I don't think it's necessarily as easy in other agencies. And I don't know why, actually. I, I used to talk a lot about um, you know, how publishers should really celebrate people with different opinions. You know, there should be someone writing a piece saying, you know, Amazon is, is going to be the death of, of medium-sized brands and someone else should write a piece saying that's nonsense. This is why Amazon will help medium-sized brands. And then as a client of a medium-sized brand, you'd look at that and think, wow, we've got two experts here. And I guess both of them have got things I can learn from. Um, you know, a real sort of vive la difference um, sort of style. And we've not quite got to that point, but, um, you know, I, th I think it's a real thing for agencies, especially networks with different expertise. Um, I think it's something they should really tap into. So you, you <clears throat> really, you've talked there about diversity of thought. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting, you know, you use the words guarded and restrained. In general, do you think the mood music is towards agencies being more liberated? Because, you know, they're going to do their best work when people don't feel guarded and restrained. So are you optimistic or pessimistic about the fact that agencies are waking up to this? Oh, that's, that's a hard question. Um, I don't know is the honest truth. Um, I think there is something that happens when people read my stuff, which is they assume I'm somehow really angry or I'm really pessimistic. And that's not true at all. I'm incredibly optimistic <clears throat> about what technology can mean. I'm incredibly optimistic about the future in almost all ways. But I get very frustrated when we don't appear to be making the most of it. So most of my sort of anger, most of my um, sort of skepticism just comes from the delta between how good things could be and how they are. And um, I think advertising agencies are amazing. Like I think, I think they're full of like the most fun, most lively, most curious, most imaginative, um, most thoughtful, brilliant people. And I get very frustrated that somehow we've entered this sort of spiral of decline where we've been convinced that we're about sort of a, a trusted pair of hands and we're about compliant people and we're about competence and we're about um, consistency. Um, because I don't think that's what we're about. I mean, we're about voicing the, 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 the feelings that consumers have. We're about leaps of faith. We're about imagination. You know, like it's not our job to make our, our clients incredibly comfortable with every single discourse we have it's our job to make our clients brilliant at their jobs and if that involves a degree of friction if that involves disagreement if that involves um being late for on a deliverable occasionally um as long as people realize it's all done with the the best interests of, of our, our clients at heart then i think that's okay but i think we've become uncomfortable with that for some reason and um I mean, I, I don't know why, to be honest, I mean, it's a whole big conversation and probably needs other people to know a lot more about it. But, but for some reason, we felt like the way to, to succeed was to be more similar to other people and to be sort of easier and to be more sort of sanitized somehow. You want me your head marks? I'm interested to know. <laughs> I, I guess it's supposed to be about me, but I'd be interested to know um, sort of how that makes you feel as a client. Well, let's, I mean, we, we can, we do jump around and give opinions yeah. as well. I mean, I think the, the bit that, gets missed somehow is when a client writes a really good brief um, they don't do enough to convince the agency that they really mean it in terms mm. of uh, the extent of radical intervention that's needed uh, and you know obviously we've worked with, with, with publicists uh, quite significantly and the, the, the best but most uncomfortable pitch I've ever been in was for the Harvey Keitel Winston Wolf stuff and, and I think we 
actively say that we want work to make us feel uncomfortable yeah in a world full of clutter um so i think you're, you're, you're spot on there is i, I believe there is uh, increasing sanitization yeah uh, so we look for agencies that are prepared to challenge us that's yeah. the thing. yeah so richie back to you no, no, no. <laughs> good, great, great point of view here um, i actually wanted to pick up on your um you were quoted once as saying talking about the advertising rah rah and that you're not a part of it and I really wanted to know what do you mean when you talk about advertising rah rah, and why aren't why weren't you a part of it? Because you sort of epitomise for me what what agency life should be, and that diversity of thought and thinking. Um, it, it's been very interesting for me actually because my first jobs in in the real world um, were nothing to do with advertising. So I worked in Comet as the sales assistant. I um, I worked at GlaxoSmithKline doing a sort of field sales role. Um, and the more that you get outside the world of advertising, the more that you realize that we're not really that important, to be honest. Like most people um, are not aware that the Ken Lions exist. And when they would see what would win, they wouldn't necessarily um, share the same enthusiasm for us. Um, and it's more a concern that we tend to be very inward looking as an industry. You know, we are, we're all very quick to mention great advertising campaigns, but we're not necessarily that, that quick to mention um, you know, really good economists or really good psycholog psychological white papers or really good architecture. Um, and I think it's, it's useful for us to know our place in the world. And I don't mean that in a depressing way because I'm extremely proud to work in, in advertising. But we are, you know, we are one part of a toolkit of many elements. And the more that we look at those um, sort of uh, those, those points where we intersect with other industries, that's where it gets very different and that's where it gets very interesting. So what can we learn from, um, you know, the work of economists? Like we, 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 we should be spending a lot more time reading um, sort of S1 filings. We should be spending a lot more time reading annual reports. Um, and instead, you know, we should be spending a lot more time going around a shopping mall and looking at how products are arranged on a shelf. Um, and instead, somehow we end up talking about quite a lot of insider baseball topics, I think. So, Tom, we, we talk a little bit about uh, people's careers and how they got to where they got to. So you, you, you clearly know your mind. It'd be interesting to know this, the, how you joined the dots in your career. You mentioned working at, at Comet, for example. So how, <laughs> how did it get to be where you are? I mean, it's been quite messy. Like the, um, the problem with having people like me on these things is we get to tell our story in quite a neat way retrospectively where it appears that we've made all sorts of wonderful decisions and it appears that everything has been easy and it appears that um, everything's worked out precisely how it should have done. Um, and while I'm very, very happy in where I've ended up in my current situation, it's, it's been very difficult. So, um, you know, I, I wish that more people would be quite honest about um, the, the ways that things have gone wrong um, and the way that you might be an unfair representative of, of how good things can be. Um, but in short, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after university. Um, I got a sort of double degree. So I got a degree in architecture and another degree in structural engineering. Um, and I say that because it's interesting because it meant that I would be quite comfortable with maths and sort of um, equations and I'd also be really interested in ideas and design and the design process and um, sort of imagination and aesthetics and that always meant I didn't really know what to do because I was a little bit good at lots of things but not that good at anything um, so I just got really lost to be honest so I just did lots of summer jobs I did lots of sort of office temporary jobs and about a year into that um, this amazing guy that I worked with called Ellis Watson he sort of brought me into his big office um, and just said Tom you know, we can't really afford you much longer, but you should work in advertising. Um, and that was the first sort of part of my life where I'd even thought about advertising. I didn't really know what it was. Um, I'd be doing lots of graduate interviews for, for investment banks and for big management consultancies. And every time I'd be preparing for them, I'd just be thinking, oh my God, this looks terrible. Like, why would I want to do this? I don't even know what investment banking is. Um, I don't want a job in it. Um, and then when I was preparing for advertising, I was just looking at ads and I was reading campaign and it was just fascinating. Um, so I didn't get into it to start with. I was, um, I, I kind of failed all the graduate recruitment schemes um, and I ended up working for a Glaxo Smith client for a while. But after, after sort of two years of doing that, I realized there was something about advertising that, that was sort of in me. Um, so I was lucky enough to sort of barge my way back in, uh, uh, into TBWA to become um, a terrible account manager for them. Um, 
And even though I have been employed by advertising agencies, um, I've never really done that much, which is kind of core to, to advertising. I haven't done that many, um, you know, uh, sort of co conversations about weather insurance for a TV ad. I haven't done that many conversations about getting market share from um, one type of jam over another. I've always been sort of lucky to be someone that they gave weird things to. So it might be, you know, a long time ago working on Nokia, I'd be part of their 2020, which was the future at that point, actually. And then this thing called 2020, which is all about the future of mobile phones and what it would mean. And I'd get involved in quite philosophical conversations about what happens if everyone's connected to each other. Um, and I'd spend time sort of producing short movies on phones um, with Gary Oldman, where I'd sort of fly out to LA and give Gary Oldman a phone and we'd make a movie together. So I was always the person they gave sort of weird things to. So I've, I've been really lucky, to be honest. I've, I've always loved my job. Tom, um, so in, in the spirit of, as you said, giving the, giving the, you know, the, the full truth or the full, the full story, <laughs> um, what, what has some, been some of the, the downs? Um, you know, how have you overcome them? What have been some of the, the issues you faced? Hmm. I, I, um, I don't feel like I've had that many extremely difficult situations. Um, I mean, to work in advertising is a privilege, and I, I don't think it was ever supposed to be easy. I mean, like, you know, there are some jobs that appear in movies and they appear in movies because they're interesting jobs. Like, you know, if there's a romantic comedy, it's never, you know, the girl's an accountant and the guy sort of works for the local council. Like it's always someone who writes movies or they design greeting cards or they work in advertising. Like we are, we are an industry based on robust personalities and sort of wild, unlikely situations and not sleeping for three days and having people throw you out of offices. Um, and I've, I've loved the challenges. I've loved the fact that we work in quite a political environment. I love the fact that things aren't fair. Um, I love the fact that you work in nuts off and then, you know, people forget that you did it and they give the credit to other people. I, I kind of quite like all the challenges that were around. Um, and, and maybe, I'm not saying I'm right, but maybe that means if you don't like those things, like maybe if you find everything hard, maybe if you don't like the sort of swaggering characters, maybe if you don't like the fact there's no training program in place, maybe if you don't like the fact that you have to work weekends here and there, but you can also sort of disappear for a long lunch break and no one notices. If you don't like that, then maybe, maybe that's not, um, maybe this isn't the best place for you. But if you love it, then, um, you know, you, you really feel it. Um, I'm trying to be more helpful, actually. Um, I've, I've had a lot of problems with people selling you on jobs. Um, so I'm, I'm not, you know, everyone listening to this is at different stages in their career. And when things go well, um, you know, people prefer romancing you into jobs and they make all sorts of promises about how wonderful it'll be and how much power you'll have. And that's why they're not going to pay you very much. And I've, I've been, um, because I'm quite naive and I'm quite romantic, um, I've been sort of uh, disappointed quite a number of ways. Um, with the way that people have sort of treated me once they've, um, it's a bit like being a client actually, the pitch is great and then when you're actually, you know, a regular client, then uh, they sort of tend to do less to kind of keep you interested. Um, and um, yeah, there's, um, I know there's, there's always been a degree of stress and there's been unpredictability and there's been, um, I don't know, just incredible uh, fatigue at some point, but um, I don't know, it's great. <laughs> Um, and uh, ever thought about client side? Um, there, there, one of the things I think is amazing about being a client is that you actually get to do it. Like in all reality, you are the, the people that get oversight on everything. And I think it must be brilliant to be the sort of interface with the CFO, um, to be sort of really the, the sort of person that orchestrates everything and understands everything. But I think, um, you know, when I, when I talk about what it is that I love about um, advertising, it, it, they're very much characteristics which are found more in the agency side. So it is the, it is the sort of dynamics, it is the changeability, it is the, um, the sort of scrappiness of it. And, and it's, a, it's really great to work across different industries, actually. Um, I, I, and I'm, I'm quite far removed from the practicalities of how accounts are run these days. But I grew up in an era where you'd probably work on two quite big clients and maybe one or two quite small. Um, and it was amazing to be in a meeting about a new probiotic yogurt that's a challenger brand and then to be in a meeting later on about a big car launch 
Um, because you'd realize that so you could learn quite a lot and um, you, you could sort of use that width to, to sort of give better advice to your clients. And I think more recently, perhaps because of this search for sort of compliance and focus and dedication and we're taking care of you um, and to sort of wrap the client with love. I think we've tended to end up with a lot of people that are just FTEs on one piece of business, um, which I think is a bit sad. Sounds great, Tom. Tom, let me move to some questions from the audience. Um, and I'm going to actually take two questions at once, um, and then you, could, you can kind of filter them through. So the first one is from Raju Nair. Um, he says, traditional marketing has been flipped around with digital and democratization of the digital ecosystem. How do mass and big brands navigate this choppy waters by growing their consumer base? As digital needs customization, um, and it's a challenge when you need to drive engagement. So that's, that's part A. And then the second one is from Lydia. Um, so you talk a lot about attitude change as a start point for digitization. Um, and it's a point she agrees with. Any examples from your practice, how this is done in big companies when they're going through a change? I find the hardest part in our company to make people embrace the change instead of being scared of it. Um, so I don't, I don't ever like answering questions in a way that seems to be sort of rude or dismissive. So um, forgive, forgive my sort of tone for, for question one, but I, th I think as an industry, we're obsessed with the fact that everything's very different. Like we're obsessed with the fact that digital's come along and that things have, uh, have sort of wildly pivoted and that the rules that have been used for advertising have been subverted and that everything is different. And I think we, we've loved talking about all the things that are different. So we love talking about influencer marketing. We love talking about personalization. We love talking about programmatic advertising. Um, we love talking about the sort of technology of how things get in front of people. We love talking about all the data we can capture. Um, but if you were a kind of uh, a sort of marketing professor that, I mean, they didn't really exist in the 1930s, but if, if you were someone that understood marketing in the 1930s and you, you came along to a, a meeting now, you'd realize that the, the, the central principles and the, the laws and the, the sort of rules of nature that we exist in, like 99% of it is, is the same. Um, you know, the purchase funnel has never been a particularly great model, but it was as flawed in 1930 as it is in 2020. Um, and I, th I think it would be useful if we focused on all the things that were the same a bit more. Um, and to do so in a, in a world where we are now, um, we have more. So we, we, can, we can apply the same principles. And as we're going through that process, there'll be lots of other things that we can do in addition. So as we're figuring out a, a sort of media plan, we'll realize how wonderful it is that we can also um, do content marketing. And as we're figuring out what the creative will look like, we'll realize how wonderful it is that we could serve these ads sequentially or they could be shorter. But I don't think we should start with the changes as the central point. Um, and I really wish we had a lot more confidence. I think, I think a lot of the problems that we face as an industry is because we feel vulnerable. We feel like we don't know enough about dynamic optimization and therefore, you know, we're a bit worried in the meeting. Um, you know, if you, if you have a bit more confidence in your broader beliefs and an understanding of consumers more generally, and if you think of these things as being quite small tactical elements that you don't need to know that much about, you just need to know what, they're, what they kind of represent, then actually we get a lot more confident in our jobs um, and that leads to better work. Um, so hopefully that, that doesn't sort of sound too dismissive. And it's not necessarily right. It's just an opinion that's um, often I'm quite wrong, but quite helpful. And people sort of, you know, are very quick to point out how wrong you were, but they're not very quick to point out how helpful being wrong was in that instance. Um, on the second one, it's a, it's a huge thing, actually. Um, and um, it's what my next venture will be about. Um, you know, everyone is very determined to, um, to sort of follow how smaller companies work. And I think big companies often give themselves a really hard time because they don't realize how good they are at being a big company and they don't realize how important it is to be a big company and how much more money they make than the companies that get celebrated. But it's certainly the case that big companies, um, you know, they employ people that were drawn to them because they are big companies and they often work in environments which are physically um, not conducive to innovation. They often... Um, KPI people on things which are unrelated to innovation. 
Um, and they often sort of pretend to innovate. So um, you get the kind of the gesture of innovation. You get the sort of Friday afternoon with the post-it notes. Um, you get the sort of Silicon Valley safaris. You get the trip to CES, perhaps. Um, but you don't get the sort of meaning of innovation. There isn't, there isn't a kind of culture of innovation. There isn't a, um, a sort of celebration of people that are a bit weird. Um, and I think, I think the first thing that a company really needs to do is to realize that this, this isn't a little sort of, um, this isn't a unit you bolt on, and this isn't a kind of little behavior that you adopt on a sort of Thursday morning, and it isn't anyone's job to do it. It's a sort of pervasive culture of how can we make this easier? You know, are these assumptions ones that we should keep on making? How do we reward people that are brilliant? Um, diversity is a huge part of this. Um, you know, I'm shocked at how alike we all are in all ways, whether it's the vague ages we are, whether it's how we look, whether it's how we behave, whether it's our class. Um, and the more we love the fact that there is a precocious and miraculous 17 year old that we were somehow able to sort of get for the summer, um, who's, you know, started selling things on, on gum tree at the weekends. Like how do we learn from, from that guy? Um, how do we find this incredible sort of elderly, um, sort of wise sort of lady that sat on boards for the last five years and has just seen it all before and she can just cut us down in seconds just by saying that's nonsense. Like a board would never approve that. Like, um, and age is a clumsy thing to, to mention, but, but we really need to look for brilliance in all sorts of places. And it's, it's likely to be found in Brixton Market. It's likely to be found in Penzance. It's likely to be found in the Orkney Islands. Um, it's likely to be found in Rotherham Community College. Um, and we, we need to really, really realize how special that is rather than sort of dabble with it a bit. Thanks, Tom. So um, uh, let's talk a little bit about personal brand. So you've obviously built a personal brand. Um, I'm interested to know how you did that, but also very specifically, what role, what role taking risks had in that building in that brand? Because I sense you, you like taking risks, you're a risk taker. So is there a linkage between the two there? I think there is. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's quite hard for me to say this without it appearing to be a bit disingenuous, but um, I don't really like the idea of a personal brand. Like, I am, I am quite shy. Um, it was never my intention to do this um, at all. And even now, the idea that I might have one is quite sort of horrifying for me in a way. Um, I think in a way, it's a, nice, it's a nice thing to think of as an accidental byproduct of being interesting. Um, I think having a sort of lively brain and being sort of curious and not being afraid to put our opinions out there. Um, I think that probably is a series of conditions that lead to that sort of thing happening, but it's, it's painfully obvious. And um, I'm not, so I'm definitely not mentioning any names in particular, but it's painfully obvious when you can see that people are trying to do this. Um, I don't really like the sort of gamification of LinkedIn. I don't really like the sort of clear strategies that people have to do this. Um, I think, you know, ideally there are people out there that are extremely curious. Ideally there are people out there that, that think for themselves. Ideally those people like putting their thoughts into words. And I think if you do that, then the environment is quite um, sort of democratic. I think um, one of the, the interesting things about social media is it does tend to be quite fair in what it bubbles up. And therefore, I think if you keep on being quite interesting, if you keep on being quite helpful, if you keep on being something that someone who writes stuff that people want to read, I think it's almost an inevitable byproduct. Um, there, there probably then becomes a bit of self reinforcing because I think when people expect you to be the sort of happy, person then you end up sort of becoming quite happy in how you write things if you become the, the sort of miserable sort of uh sort of curmudgeonly type then that comes across in everything you do but i think um i actively avoid this idea that i might get stereotyped to some sort of trope and it sort of it, it annoys me and sort of worries me when people think that there's almost one dimension to someone that's actually a whole sort of rounded human being mm -hmm. That's great. And I just, I just want to stop for one second and pause and just to let everyone know that, I mean, I'm taking so much away from this and actually you guys have an opportunity here to actually get a little bit more time with Tom. All you need to do is take that screenshot and actually put down your favorite Tom Goodwin quote um, onto LinkedIn, copy us in for a chance to win a mentoring session with Tom. So please do that. 
Um, Tom, I've got a question for you. Um, you were once quoted as saying that you've got about 20 different uh, revenue streams coming in. How on earth did you create that? And which ones are your favorites? Which ones do you focus on? <laughs> Again, it's all, um, it's all very accidental. So um, it's quite easy in these situations to presume that there was this big grand plan and that everything's happened for um, very intelligent reasons. Uh, it's, it's more just a sort of byproduct of having a, a lively brain in a way. Um, so there's everything, you know, I, I quite quickly realized that um, when I was traveling as much as I was, um, it was hugely sort of uh, concerning to me that no one was using my apartment while I wasn't there. Um, so I just became someone that would rent out their apartment on Airbnb. And then I realized how, how much joy I got from that and how great it was to leave a bottle of wine for people. Um, so I just got really into the idea of sort of sharing Airbnb. Um, similarly, I've, I've really sort of enjoyed um, furniture and sort of beautiful pieces that um, you sort of find on the internet that people don't realize the value in. So I ended up just buying and, and selling furniture because my apartment was quite big. Um, you know, I did a training course um, in sort of better sales skills because I got very frustrated. Um, and again, it's quite easy to sound miserable, but um, you know, when you when you do a cold email to someone, there is there is a real craft to how you can get people's attention early on. And, and I'm sort of fascinated with how good some approaches can be, but how awful 99% of approaches are. Um, so I just decided that that you know, rather than just complaining about it, I could be more helpful by um, by working with a sort of training company to produce a training program to help people um, sell to people like us. Um, and then they ended up sort of paying me money and it's a sort of reoccurring revenue stream. Um, so there, there are all sorts of sort of weird and wonderful things, you know, speaking at events, a bit of consulting here and there. Um, I don't know, they're all, um, you know, they're all quite different. Sounds awesome. Yeah, so um, so you, you've had uh, many, many twists and turns in your, your career. And, and actually what you've described is very much in sync with the concept of the show, which is that, Life has many undulations and twists and turns. The purpose of the School of Marketing is to encourage people from a more diverse background into the marketing industry. So from all of your experiences, what would your words of encouragement and advice be to people trying to get into marketing and advertising? Um, I, th I think it's a more fair environment than people think. Um, and that, that may be... Um, something that people will criticize me for saying because obviously I'm a sort of white male of the right sort of age um, and and therefore I, I won't know the challenges that other people have had but I more than any other industry I, I do feel like the brilliance that people have is is sort of easier to see somehow I think imagine being an amazing accountant I don't think anyone can see your sort of P&L and sort of walk across the office and just be like wow you know that's amazing maths, like come and sit in this big meeting room. Um, like I, I have only ever worked in offices where there are big pitches going on with the most senior people in the company leading them. And, you know, they might actively come out on a Thursday at six o'clock in the evening and just be like, ah, like we need some help. Who can help? And anyone that was in the office that, you know, that, that smiled at that point would then be in a pitch. And then you're in a pitch and someone's saying, you know, over the weekend, we've got to try and figure out what the, you know, the new rules of aviation will mean. What does the, what are the five degrees of freedom in the skies mean? Like someone come back to me on Monday and do a presentation to the group about that. And if you're great, then, then you will do that and you will present it and everyone will think you're amazing. And um, so, so I think, I think we're a much more fair environment that, that people think. Um, I think it's important to be nice. I think um, people quite often get confused with the complexity of me saying it's a fairly sort of dynamic, robust industry with big characters and politics, but, 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 but being a sort of good person will really, really help. Um, there are lots of people I think that try to sort of trick their way to the top by being sort of super aggressive and making it clear they don't have time for people. And they think that that sort of ballsiness will, will reflect well on them and people will think they must be sort of important and busy. But no, um, you know, the, generally speaking, our industry does a very good job of, of getting very um, nice, good people to the top. Um, I think believe in yourself quite a lot. Like, um, maybe this is unfair, but I don't, I don't think we work in the most complicated industry on the planet. You know, I, I look at people that are sort of smashing atoms together in uh, subatomic particle accelerators. Like that's a difficult job. 
um, more often than not, you know, our role comes down to principles like, are we trying to get different people to buy it or the same people to buy it more? I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty simple. Um, what are we going to say to those people to get them to buy it more often? That's quite simple. Um, and more than anything else, we have, we have the key to our jobs because we are human beings. Like our job is to primarily understand human beings and how we behave. And we are one, so we can think about how we feel. And we also have lots of us around. So if you ever want to, you know, talk about a strategy, just, you know, go to the pub with your friends and just say, you know, would, would doing this, uh, you know, would a loyalty card for your deodorant really work? No, Tom, that would be a terrible idea. I don't really care that much about my loyalty. I would not celebrate being gold status on Dove deodorant. And then you're like, yeah, that's a terrible idea. I'll, I'll tell the client that their brief about a loyalty program is rather silly and I'll suggest something else. So I think as long as you realize that you're probably right and your gut is probably telling you the right things, um, you know, believe in yourself. And again, and I don't mean this in a threatening way, but... It, it may be that your gut is wrong. It may be that you, you believe in yourself and you express opinions and people don't welcome those opinions because you're not very good at this. Um, and that's fine. Like that there are many other wonderful careers that people can have. Um, but, but I worry that in this age of data, um, we've, we've had our kind of senses blunted a little bit. And it's, it's quite hard to be precocious and brilliant right now because people will sort of force you to come up with them. Um, some sort of quant to, to show what you think is just common sense, really. Mm, that's awesome. And I, 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 love the, I love the thought about just being nice. I think a lot of CEOs and, and big directors that I've come across in the corporate scene, for some reason, just feel that they, they don't need to. And I think that's utter bollocks. But, um, you know, there's, there's those few people who are actually nice. Who, and, I, and I think you mentioned that person who is brilliant. I suspect that person would have had, you know, had, had time for you. Had, you know, gave, gave you that, that, that sort of belief in yourself. So I love that thought. Um, I just want to come on to uh, two questions um, from, from the audience. And they're sort of interlinked and related. Um, the first one's from Barney, and then the second one's from Shariar. So, so Barney um, talks about um, an article that, you re that, you, that he read about you in The Guardian about 5G a couple of years ago, and then comes on to ask, um, can you give any advice for people working agency side that are trying to do the day job while also finding a platform as an authentic content creator. And Ashari has got a related question about what your thoughts on article on writing articles in places like GQ or Forbes, I suspect as part of that content creation or becoming a content creator. Yeah, I think um, uh, often we, we've kind of got our roles the wrong way around and um, this is advice for people depending on the stage of their career. Um, so unfairly, probably the first three years in your career, and these are mass generalizations, and please, please take this as a sort of intimate one-on-one -on -one session rather than a, a sort of broadcasting platform to say clumsy things that look bad in other environments. But, but generally speaking, for the first three, three years of your career, you're not as helpful as you think you are, um, and you're not rewarded based on the best thing you do every week you are there based on the worst thing that you do every week and the things that you mess up. Um, and those years are really not you being, you know, you're not earning your stripes or whatever the old opinion was. Um, you're just there to sort of absorb stuff and to, to sort of take it all in and to be um, a vital person that creates an environment where wonderful things happen. So you're incredibly important, but your importance is often demonstrated in things that don't appear to be that glamorous. It's not a movie where you come up with the big idea and everyone claps. Um, and then over time, um, it'll become quite obvious what your key value is. And if you are a sort of account manager, type person and then your, your brilliance is based on superb relationships with the client understanding their business brilliantly um, and and generally generally um, creating an environment where where wonderful things can happen which is where I spent most of my career and it's an amazing job and it's incredibly important if you are a strategy style person then you will accidentally find yourself running late for meetings because you're reading a book about something weird um, you'll accidentally miss phone calls because you got really stuck into tech crunch um, and I think what we've tended to do is, um, you know, we, th there's this amazing thing that professor did once about life where he had sort of a big container and he put tennis balls in it. Um, and then he put sort of ping pong balls in it and then he put sand in it. 
And the idea was that the first things that you put into that bowl become the sort of the rigid elements that other things have to work around. You know, and for most people, um, their job might be a tennis ball and then their friends become the sand that fits around their job. And that's one way to live life, but, but be aware of what you're sort of displacing with the things that you fix. And I think our industry has become obsessed with the fact that the things that you fix are emails that you reply to and um, uh, sort of meetings that you attend and uh, doing timesheets and um, turning up on time. And something like being a relentlessly interesting, well-informed, um, superbly creative person, like stuff like that has become the sand that's around. Um, and that becomes a sort of luxury. So, you know, I have lots of people that have said to me over the years, Tom, I just don't have time to go and see my client's stuff in the store. And I'm like, that's the thing that you do above everything else. Um, you know, Tom, I don't have time to look at all the competitor ads that people are putting out. That's, that's, that's your core thing. And I think the, the best way to think of us, um, and this sounds quite pretentious, and again, the, the reality of life is more complex than this, but the best way to think of us is to be um, athletes and our brains are our muscles. And it's our job to basically be working out all day long. Um, like Usain Bolt is not the perfect example of this because I don't think he, he trains that hard, but I'm trying to think of another. I know Daley Thompson, I'm really showing my age here. Sorry for everyone on this call that's going to have to Google him. But he was an amazing decathlete. And I'm pretty sure Daley Thompson probably spent all day every day in the gym. And then occasionally they'd sort of fly him to Tokyo and he'd do a race or he'd throw a javelin or something. And he, he would have to be brilliant for a very short amount of time. But no one would ever look at Daley Thompson and be like, oh, mate, you're not even working. You're just in the gym. Like, like his primary job was to be incredibly fit and healthy. And most people's job in advertising, their primary job is to be well informed, to understand how the world economy is doing, to understand what their client's share price is doing, to understand what their uh, margin is, to understand what emerging competitor threats are. And the little bits where you demonstrate that um, become secondary. And I think um, what, what success I have had happened to me is because I realized that you know, being on Twitter was actually my job. Like it meant I got to learn about the world. It meant I got to read lots of interesting people's opinions. And I was never embarrassed about how much time I spent on Twitter. Um, writing was my job. Like these were all manifestations of what was a sort of brain that I was working out all the time. And actually writing is exercise for your brain. Um, arguing with people on Twitter is exercise for your brain. Um, going to a conference is, is exercise for your brain. And I think people thought of them as being the things that you fitted in around your job. And actually that is your job. Wow. Yeah, Tom, uh, really powerful words and, and great guidance there. And uh, unfortunately, we've got, we're absolutely inundated with questions. I think probably more than we've had for quite a while, uh, which is great. But we are, we are out of time. So um, it, it remains for me just to wrap up and, and thank you. And I think what I thank you for is your honesty, straightforwardness, in, insightfulness and I think if you said it was Ellis Watson yeah day, amazing character those are the, the things that probably made them him or her think that you were probably suitable for the job you've had and the jobs you've had and the careers you've had so thank you thank you very much and I know on behalf of everybody it's been a fascinating session so thank you Tom my pleasure great to have had you on and so just just as an outro for everybody just a headline for next week uh, we've got Lord Karen Billimara from Billimoria from Chel of Chelsea uh, who's the founder of Cobra Beer, who's going to tell us the story of scaling uh, that business to what it is today. And if you, if you really want to, you can be having a Cobra Beer for breakfast. Uh, next week. That will be very permissible. Uh, but for now, just a massive thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on.